very much and good afternoon to all of you. Well, I shall uh, concentrate on a topic which uh, finds its origin, I mean, which finds its origin very early Indian art, but is really represented from the Gupta period, as you see it on the screen, which is the royal or the divine throne. This is a motif which you see here, which uh, includes a number of animals, real, I mean, I mean, I mean real, I mean, they are, we can see them, they are material, they are exist in our reality. Because the artist, the development of the team, we also show that what is real can not be necessarily seen. But here you have the elephant, the viala, the makara, and the bird. So these four elements, this, this what is the throne, which starts in the Gupta period, which has, why is it not moving? Okay, thank you, sorry, sorry and which really will be uh, represented up to the end of the 12th century in Eastern India. You have it here on a Buddha image, a Vishnu, a Devi. You have here the succession of elements. So what I want to try is to show you how we came to this result. What are the origin of these four elements and how they combined? The first element which we have to deal with is the lion throne. The lion throne appears here on this image of the Kushan Emperor, which is in the Mathura Museum. You have here two lions. Uh, excuse me, before I go on, do you see also on my screen this the small image is there, right? Or, or is it you, you see properly the entire screen, the Pima Taktu and Akim? Uh, the two images are visible. Uh, okay. Large, large okay, very good. And you have here a profile view of this throne with the lion emerging. The lions are there as real animals, depicted as real animals. They are there as symbol of power. They are also there to protect the ruler and also the, to aggress those who could attack the power. This royal throne has a very long history and I will not go into detail, I must say, for the other elements as Dr. Vinay Kumar this morning has shown in a very uh, elaborate way, the origin of some of the elements which I'm going to show, but I want to show you here some of the very early third millennium BC depiction of this royal throne in Egypt or in Mesopotamia. You have here a goddess with a row of elef of lions really supporting the throne, defending the, the deity. And this will be preserved all through the centuries. You get it up to the Roman period, where you have the goddess Sibel, who is a, a city goddess or a mother goddess. I mean, she's a kind of universal goddess who has always two lions on her side, has her chariot pulled by lions. And here we have her depiction from Aikanun. This is important because Aikanun was one of the capital of the Kushan. So this is through the Kushan that the topic enters into India. Here, two contemporary practically example. The motif of the lion throne is found in Gandhara, like in Mathura. So there, of course, with the image of the Buddha, it gains another meaning. Let us remember that the Buddha is the voice of, the Buddha is the voice of the lion. The throne will be called Simhasana. So, I mean, a very heavy symbolism is attached to this animal. Another element which we will find when we see the lions depicted on the, the pedestal, it is that, as I mentioned, the lions are genuine, are real material elements. We can see them, they, are, they exist. And they exist in this in the image at the lower level. The lower level of the image is devoted to the depiction of human practicing worship devotions. It's also there that the inscriptions, the devotee inscriptions is usually made. So this is really the part of the image which corresponds to our existence. So if in Mathura the lion remains rather realistic in its way in being depicted, it's not always the case in Gandhara, where you can have the kind of short cut, if I may say, in the representation of the animal with only the face, and the face, this is the voice, this is the mane of the uh, animal, which symbolizes also the sun, and it is the leg, which is like spit out of the mouth of the lion, the leg, which indicates the movement of the animal. And this, this 
type of um, representation of the lion, you will find it, in fact, in very rare early representation in Andhra Pradesh. So here you have an example where you have the, the face of the lion and the lower part of his leg. Now you have only the leg here, and this is a um, motif which, in fact, is going also in the region very quickly will disappear. You have here a panel from Kanaganahali, where you see, in fact, with the real lion supporting the Simhasana. And here, this black from Nagarjuna Konda. Here, you have here a detail from this part. You have here the Buddha seated on a real throne. He's really above the people around him, above the monks around him. He's really somehow protected by the throne. And the throne is supported by the two lions. We'll come back in a moment on the other animals. You have here other lions, which are in fact standing up, rearing up, and they are in fact supporting the armrest and also some are in the back supporting the lintel of the throne. So we should here also make a difference between also the, the reality, what is, I mean, I mean, what I mean reality again, I mean all world and then the supramundane world. This is our world, this is more fantastic. And not a reality in the dealing of the animals of the throne in India will be that the real genuine animal in India is the elephant. You find him everywhere. The lion is another question. It's more, it's seen in the Northwest and it's in this function here imported. So again here, you have here these four viala or rearing up lions, which are supporting the armrests or the lindels. In a moment, we will see this other type of animal, which is the bakara. Now to understand the development of this lion, and here I want to refer again to the lecture of Dr. Vinay Kumar this morning, uh, we have to go back in time and in Sanchi Stupa number two. Uh, Stupa number two was what I, like Mathura around the same period and after, what was I would call it a laboratory where the artist started, tried many, many things. They made many experiences, um, creating sometimes very wild elephant. Here you have the, the bull and you have the elephant and you have the stag. Um, some will disappear, some will be preserved like the Makara or the Naga. But uh, I want to concentrate on these two uh, griffins, the body of the lion, and elements from the eagle. The eagle also in India, it will be Garuda. The eagle is of course a super symbol of the sun, just like the lion. And this griffin, we find them again, and we saw it also this morning, at the various places on the Toranas of the great stupa of Stanchi. You have here a view of the inner side of the Western Torana, here a detailed view, where you see that every level, uh, every place, where the, the pillars cross the horizontal uh, reliefs, you have the winched lion, even with a stack of, of the horns of the stack, meaning again, this solar symbolism is here very strong and the lions appear really there as protecting, defending the monuments. They are fantastic. They are not those which you can meet when you go in the zoo or in the landscape. But when you look at what happens on the Torana East, Eastern Torana, the inside face again, we will see a detail of these two relief here. The lower part, you have the genuine elephant worshiping a stupa. Here you have the seat of the Buddha with a tree and you have around him four real lion, really see as protecting. They are here depicted really like we have seen in the Kushan images of the emperor or like on the Buddha image, facing us, looking at us, protecting, guarding this side. A feature which, an element which appears here is that the lions are real, the buffaloes are around, which comes to worship the tree also. But if you look properly in the background behind these buffaloes here and here above and behind, you have their fantastic animals, which means that a clear distinction is made between all reality, the tree where the Buddha, where Shakyamuni became Buddha, 
protected by real lions, protected and worshipped by real animals. And then on another level, unseen, you have this real unseen animal fantastic, which comes like here, the Garuda, for instance, which you can recognize with the Naga. Here you have also here detail of um, lions with a human face, also Dr. Kumar Shultan. And here you have the griffins again. So this is what you have this dif distinction between the two levels, which is very clear, which you also observe in Bharat. Here, the Turana of Bharat in the Indian Museum. Again, you have here the level with the elephant. Here again, the throne of the Buddha, protected by two elephants, two, two lions here, sorry, two real lions. And in behind them, so at distance from this reality, you have here a lion with a human face, and there is again the eagle, the beak of the eagle. A further element which appears in Bharat is the makara. So the makara is depicted as if swallowing these reliefs. They are at all three levels. The makara appears in the third century BC at Loma Srishi, and we will see now a detail of this entrance. The Makara is here still the Garial, depicted in a very realistic way with the elephant worshipping. And I'll show in the next slide a detail of this Garial, which is here in the above part. So what you see here is this is an um, early relief from Mathura. In these two cases, you compare to this uh, Garial from the Chambal River, you will see that he has the long snout with this naval protuberance the protruding eye, he has also these ridges on his back. And even there, the back is depicted also the same way. So here at this uh, very early period, you still have really the artist who depict the animal as it is. But of course, this is going to change very, very quickly. Here you have two relief from on the right side, Sanchi number two, here Bharat, the garial is really now the makara. It's the animal which is half crocodile, half fish. As you see, the tail is always the tail of a fish. The garial is an animal which eats only fishes. This is here quite clear. But from this early period also, since he is living in waters and what is the Indian flower, which has a very heavy, very rich symbolism, which is born out of water, this is of course the lotus. So the makara becomes very quickly somehow the symbol of fertility. Out of his mouth grows the lotus. Here Sanchi two, here Sanchi one. You have here huge long description, the depiction, very detailed of this lotus, which arises from the open mouth of the makara, with still a protuberance at the, the end of his node, but he has only two legs here and he has really a fish tail. So, I mean, the way is open to have the makara getting in course of century all fantastic forms. Now, going back to more source, uh, at a certain moment there, the makara and the viala will be combined. And what we see here, I think, is practically the combination of two elements found one in Bharat. In Bharat, the Makaras really swallow the reliefs. And in Sanchi, where well, you don't have Makaras, but you have these fantastic lions or, or elephants even, which are put on the relief extremity and protect the animal to the facing the external world. And somehow here in the source, they combine both these elements in a rather a rare fashion. It will be forgotten in the following century. And what you get then is a motif which will found, which will have a huge impact and a great development in India and outside India. That's the Makara. Let us remember the Makara is a source of fertility, source of life practically being at the bottom of the water. So it can be also the source of the viala of the lion. And here you have this uh, example from Badami, and it will travel outside India in Cambodia, where in fact the Makara and the Leogriff swallows the Torana. This is of course also a motif which you found uh, with the 
Parava and the Chalukya. And the uh, interesting feature, with, well, which is also a feature which one knows, notice in a general way in Indian iconography, is that motifs can sometimes disappear or sleep for many centuries, and suddenly they reappear in another region of India centuries later. We are here in the ninth, late ninth, second half of the ninth century in Bodh Gaya, and here you have two examples of the Makara with the lion jumping out of his open mouth. So this is something, as I said, which one observed for a number of such details. The Makara was actually depicted also in Troon. And here again, this example, which I showed already some moment ago with the viala here, so the rearing up lions. And you have there the lintel of the throne and the armorers, which are really finished by these makaras. So what happens, what can be understood here, it appears, appears as if the makaras, like these wild elef, uh, lions, are somehow jumping out of the main central deity. This is also what we observed in, in real Gupta period in the notes, two examples from Sarnath, where you have here the viala, and here you see that this lion has even still the wings, which we observe at the early period, the makara, the makara is there, the viala is there, and the throne, the low, uh, lion throne is still there. So you have here this combination practically of water, symbolism of water, and symbolism of, of wind and fire, by this fantastic lion and this fantastic makara. They are both fantastic, they are no more real. This is also what you observe in this cave in Ajanta, where you have the makara, the, the lion, and it's standing in fact now on the elephant. Another feature which appears also at this Gupta period are the warriors. You see they are really fighting against each other on the other side of this, um, fantastic lion, which doesn't have its wings, but he has the horns here. So this is really no more the lion as we have it in the royal throne, the lion throne. Then the fourth element, the third element, because we have seen the makara, we have seen the lion, now comes the third one, which is the elephant. The elephant appears also very early in the Indian architecture, and it has a function which is to support the temple or support the religious monuments. Here a detail of this Pitalkora landscape where we had, we had here the frieze with the elephants supporting the monuments. The same is observed in the courtyard which precedes the Chaitya Hall in Kali. You have there three peaceful elephants, massive, not moving, really having the function of supporting what's what is above them. So they, they all somehow support the, the temple. I mean, this holy shrine. This is going to be, to survive all through the centuries, but again, it reappears centuries later. And now we have to come back to this remark, which I made at the beginning. The elephant is really the, it's a genuine an, uh, animal of India and the elephant, the lion is somehow an intruder and the uh, intruder, it, enters into this function of supporting the temple through its position in the royal throne, supporting the image of the divine. It tries also this lion to support the temple, but the result is of course that the elephant is not very happy with this solution. And as you have here two examples from Patatadakal, where you see that in fact the animals are fighting. The, the lions and the elephant, sorry, are not the peaceful one, which we have seen in the two uh, Buddhist caves uh, at the early period. They are really moving, trying to defend their space. And here they are attacked by two lions. The best and greatest way where this, this fight will be depicted is the Kalashnata in Elora in the eighth century. The entire lower part of the temple is in fact adorned by a huge frieze with elephants and lion. The elephants are very peaceful. They don't move when they are not disturbed, but they are there with these lions, which tries to fit in, to take their position and you have there a number of scenes where here you had a lion at the corner, here you have a lion biting the, uh, the elephant, here you have these huge scenes of fight, 
here you had two lion, two elephants in the middle was a lion and some of them made him disappear even here. And a young elephant being aggressed by a lion, another lion there be, being aggressed by two elephants. So the, the elephants in fact are trying, if I may say, to chase away the lion from there. What is their space, which is to support the temple as image of the universe. And they do it, they succeed it. You will see in a moment, sometimes the lion, very mean, steals an element from the uh, elephant. And this motif finds also its way, was also found in Patadakal, and will also be found in Cambodia. So the lion with the, some other trunk of the elephant. Now, the lions have here, still in the Kalashnata, they have really reached what is their place. They are symbol of the sun. They have to be in the above position. They are here on two lotus, which are also symbols of purity, but also symbols of uh, sun. Uh, in um, most temples, you have a lotus, which is depicted at inside at the top of the ceiling. In all um, temples from Pagan, where you still have wall paintings, you have the lotus, which is painted still inside above the main image in the shrine. So here you have this lion which move freely like the sun, they are moving around. So they, the lions belong to the upper part, the elephant to the lower part. And again, going through the century, we find here again in ninth and, ten, and early 10th century in Kokiha, you find again this remembrance that at a certain moment, which we found in uh, the Chalukya kingdom and with the Rashtrakuta in, uh, in Elora, that both animals can be distributed in the lower part of the temple. This is really a temple structure, which is here present. As you can see, you have the Gavakshas and really pillars which are carved. So the, the Buddha really sits here on a, on, a, on a temple practically. And if you pay attention, you will see that in this Gavaksha, you have in fact lion's face. So they are really above this elephant also. The fight was never forgotten. Here are some examples again from uh, Bengal Bihar. This is 12th century, but these are 9th century, late 8th, and this is 9th century. Well, you see that in the pedestal, again, the lion is really trying to tame the, the elephant in a quite uh, wild way. This is from Bihar, this is from Southeast Bangladesh, this is from North Bengal. So you see this motif traveled far away. But again, it's, these are very isolated representation. It's not typical. Of. Now let's go to the fourth element, which is the element of air, which is, of course, the bird. What you found in uh, the Maharashtra caves of the Gupta period is uh, this succession of the elephant, the viala, and the makara. And after the makara, and you see better here on the wall, in these murals, you have a long neck of a bird which arises. Again, the, just like you had representations of uh, the, the leogryph of the, the lion arising out of the mouth of Makara, you can also have the bird which free himself from this um, situation and is put above the lintel. Quite normally, the ham size we know is really the symbol of the soul which travels. It's also the, the, the Vahana of Brahma. It's really the animal which belongs to, to the sky. It's wind, it's air. And you have him so here on the left side. And in the context of Bengal Bihar, very quickly, he will be, the pair will be replaced by a couple of divine musicians. You have here, so again, this, some elements, have, some of these characters have been shown this morning by Dr. Kumar even at an earlier period, uh, you have these kinaras and the human body with the tail of the bird playing music. And here you have a complete topic, the elephant, the lion, the makara, the hansa. I mean, the, it, this, the motif in this area of Bengali is not limited to the Buddhist star, but is found also in Hindu or in Jain art. And here you have two examples from Bengal, from Southeast Bangladesh even. Um, you have the elephant, the lion, the makara, the hamsas, and here you see very clearly the two musicians playing vina or cymbals. You see also that the, um, the warriors can be also preserved in these uh, motifs. 
So this is what you have when you reach the end of the development, starting from, from the very early period, passing through the monasteries of Andhra Pradesh, because I think it is there that the concept, concept was born to have really these, these various elements brought together around the throne. Uh, here you see it, you have here Devi, here Vishnu, there Buddha. So the complete set is preserved with the lion in the Buddha image. And here you have also the makaras with wild, uh, wild figure, here a detail for a three-dimensional makara, which is in the Patna Museum, where you see that the figure which comes out is not a pleasant figure. It's like the lion, the lion, the makaras. I mean, these are quite wild animals, and I think they have a function not only to explain that um, this power is coming out of the, the deity, whoever he or she can be, but it's also the function of protecting and defending the image. And you can see here, it's really a ferocious male figure who has there depicted. Now this throne, um, this depiction of throne was felt as very important uh, in uh, Bihar. And one has quite a few, uh, one has found quite a few of these uh, quite tall image. The image which you have seen, the, which you see now is a picture from around hundred years ago uh, when the image was still in situ and measures in three meters, 20 to four meters. It's a very, very tall image. Uh, today, it looks like that. Uh, which is a bit sad, I come back to the past. You see here on the back, the Buddha sit with, in front of a, of a cushion. And on the other side, you have these two half of which you have the detailed picture left and right. And now how it is today, the left part is in the Patna Museum, the right part is still in situ. Now you see here that really, in fact, the, the two warriors, I mean, it's really practically a fight between the man uh, sitting on the elephant and defending himself against the aggression of the man sitting on the, on the white lion. The horns being born out from the eyes, which is a, a deep, um, development of the lion or the white elephant, which you, elephant, lion story, which you have also in other parts of India. Another set of image was found um, in early, early 20th century in Vishnupur, a bit northeast from uh, Bodh Gaya. Um, with a set of figures like the Buddha and the two Bodhisattva, Maitreya, Avalokiteshvara, and in the back you had again this depiction of the throne. Now the set of sculpture uh, has been has been brought to the Patna Museum uh, in the course of time, and unfortunately the the composition, because it was a composition in itself, where the Buddha with the two Bodhisattvas and the throne has been completely dismantled, and you have there lying in the gallery, the back, but it allows you to see better how it was, in fact. You had really a cushion behind the Buddha, two pillars which support this ornamentation. So with this, I want to conclude with this detailed image of Manjushri from North Bengal, because it shows you quite clearly uh, where we are in the 12th century. You have the elephant, the wild lion, the makara, and the musicians. Here playing cymbals, they are playing the vena. So this is really the deity, whoever, again, this deity can be female or male, Buddhist or Hindu, it doesn't matter, who is depicted uh, with a throne behind him or her, as if these elements are in fact arising out of this person, this character. So as if, you know, this character is at the origin of these elements. So they have different function. They symbolize the different elements like the earth, the fire, the water, the air. They are there to protect the divine image. They are quite wild going to the outside. But at the same time, they symbolize the power of creativity of this central image. And with this image, I am concluding my talk. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Claudin, uh, for this very fantastic uh, presentation. And thanks once again for uh, making our attention or bringing our attention to the uh, not so noticed type of uh, the hybrid beings and the symbolism behind the combination of uh, these uh, three symbolic animals. Uh, thank you very much for that.
Now this paper is open for discussion. Well, it's a very, very intricate, complica complicated topic, of course. Yeah, uh, and uh, all the more for the first time we are seeing it in this way, no? Okay, good. <laughs> but I was very happy to see this morning the talk of Dr. Kumar. <laughs> Uh, yes, and especially that Toranas, uh, we never noticed that uh, at the uh, two sides, there are these kind of mythical images. We were just, I mean, uh, me, yes. not we actually. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, that's a part, the point is this, where you are in India, on which top, on which area you are working. And uh, the interesting thing I found with the development of this topic, I mean, of this animal combination, is that it's, they appear uh, in different part of India, the, late century BC already, but I think the combination really took place in the south, I mean, in Andhra Pradesh, the, the, the link to the throne. I mean, the, the, the lion is really there from the beginning with the Kushan, there is no problem, but the presence of the, the lions and the Makaras, this is clear that it's uh, in the site of Amaravati and other side of the region that it was, that it there appears. Yeah, and in short, that it is the same uh, in that uh, Hindu uh, religion also, no, in the Hindu temples also. And uh, this, uh, I think that we have to see these kind of images uh, in the Kerala sculptures too, that okay. we have looked in, uh, in that way. And okay. thank you very much for that. Yes. Okay.